want you to take your Bible. We're going through the book of Genesis. I think it'd be good if you followed in your Bible, so turn to chapter 11, if you would, please. Chapter 11 is a very interesting account. It's, you've heard of the Tower of Babel. Maybe you've heard a language program advertised on the radio, Babel. Guess where that comes from, right? The name of that program has to come from this right here. They have to have had some knowledge of, Je of Genesis chapter 11 to name that language learning program Babel. But I hope it doesn't end up uh, in confusion uh, if you use that program. But anyway, Genesis 11 really is three sections that make up the whole chapter, and you'll see as we go through. But what I want to say at the outset is that what these three sections really show us is that God is at work. God is at work. You know, some people, even if they acknowledge God, think that he is disconnected from his world and from people. But I want to tell you, the Bible shows exactly the opposite. The Bible reveals that God is always at work in his world because, as we saw last week, God created this world. And God created the nations and the peoples of this world. And he cares deeply for them. In fact, Scripture tells us in so many different ways, but perhaps the most profoundly is that God loves the world and is not willing that anyone should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. But you know, God's holy. That's his nature. And God is just, and I'm grateful for that. And because of being holy and just, he has to judge. But do you know, the Bible reveals that even in judgment, God's marvelous plan of reclamation and restoration is visible. God does not judge so that he can wash his hands of us and be done with us. God judges in mercy. And I think that's what we see here. I want us to pause, have a word of prayer, and then look at the first section, verses 1 to 9, the Tower of Babel, here in Genesis chapter 11. So, Heavenly Father, as we come before you once again this morning, we realize that this Bible is the Word of God and not merely the writings of men. Holy men of God that you specially chose were divinely superintended by you to write down the very word of God that you want us to have, and we do have, and we're very thankful for it. At this time, we need you and your word more than anything else, and I pray that perhaps you would show us the parallel between our current events and the Tower of Babel, where it all kind of harkens back to. Lord, will you use this message? Will you use it to work in individual hearts as well as people groups? Would you get your message across to people? And Lord, be glorified. Lift up Jesus through this, and may people be drawn to him. We ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, I want to remind you of Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, when Noah, his three sons, and their wives emerged from the ark after the flood. God blessed Noah, it said, and God blessed his sons. And here's what God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the word replenish actually refers to spreading out all over the earth. That's God's command. So I want you to look at chapter 11. Let's read the first four verses. It says, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, 
that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Now I want you to get that fourth verse in particular, because I want you to see that what happens at the Tower of Babel, those first nine verses could be summed up in just one word, rebellion. What is happening here is an act of pure rebellion against God, against God's plan. And I want you to think with me how it all comes, how did this happen? Well, it's all part and characteristic of what we are as human beings. And one of the first leading characteristics, especially here as it becomes a collective group of people bunched together, one of the first things that is characteristic and common in the spirit of the world, if I could call it that, that's what we see here, the spirit of the world, this is what the world is all about, is egotism. Here's a people that uh, become conscious of their new ability, and they are preparing themselves to, to glorify themselves and to fortify themselves by a collective effort, by pooling their resources. And really, what it is, it's an egotistical, really a typical grandioso plan of them in ultimate achievement of mankind. There is a parallel here to modern uh, technological advance, and I'm certainly not against that. But there is a warning that I think ought to go along with every advancement in our culture, and that is that it can lead to a real level of egotism that ends up becoming in a rebellion against God. But that's not all here. I see in verse 4, in this collective effort that is going on at what is called the Tower of Babel, a, 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 a humanism. There is a uniting together uh, to reach a full potential and greatest good, <laughs> totally independent of God. Without God in the picture, that's exactly what humanism is. It is man, independent of God, seeking to control the world and his destiny. That's what's happening here in simple form. But there's something else here. Verse 4 also, I think, the spirit of the world is not only seen in their egotism and in their humanism, but if I could put it this way, in their globalism. Because they're insecure. You read between the lines and you find there's a big insecurity here, and so they're banding together to protect their identity and to control their fortunes. And it's doable because they all originally spoke the same language and used the same expressions. That's what verse 1 tells us. And so it lends itself to a globalism. The spirit of the world is we want to be one. We're in charge of this world and our destiny. We are going to do it. We're going to reach the greatest good. There's one more thing that I, that I see here that may not be as apparent, but it's clear to me and that is, what you have is these people, and some in particular, stirring up others to join them in overthrowing the existing order. That's called activism. The spirit of the world is egotism. The spirit of the world is humanism. The spirit of the world is globalism. 
but it is also activism. That is the use of direct confrontation, whether it be strikes or protests or riots, to oppose and to support your cause. And so you band together with other groups of people in order to overthrow the existing order to institute what you want to see in the world. So I want to tell you what is going on currently is just simply what happened at the Tower of Babel. It is the spirit of the world. This is how it's always been. This is how it will continue until Jesus comes and puts it down once and for all, and establishes his world empire, his kingdom. I want to now think in this passage, in the next few verses, not only about the spirit of the world that we see in the Tower of Babel, but the history of the world that is here. Look with me, if you will, in verses 5 through 9. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all one language, and they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it, I want you to catch verse 9 in particular, the name of the city is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. What we have here is the history of the world. And if I could put the history of of the world In just a nutshell, I would say that it it amounts to this. The history of the world is mankind's desire to overthrow God, to get rid of God. The psalmist says it so eloquently in Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Jesus the Messiah. And here's what they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Well, what is God's response to all of that? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. This is the desire of the shakers and movers in this world. And that is to overthrow God's rule, to undo any divine restraints upon them or upon this world. And it's both ridiculous and serious at the same time. But I want you to look at it in uh, verse 2 and verse 9, because I want you to see some geography here. You ready? You like geography? In verse 2, there is reference to a land called the land of Shinar. In verse 9, there is reference to a city called Babel. Those two are connected. The city of Babel was built in the land of Shinar. And really, if you search this out, what you're going to discover is that land is the cradle of civilization. That is where human civilization began. The word Shinar, that land of Shinar, literally means a country of two rivers, meaning it was land that was situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And the city called Babel, the city called Babel is a city that we heard of last week, in chapter 10, it was built by a powerful, tyrannical leader called Nimrod. And uh, we read in uh, chapter 10 that uh, he built this city, it says in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. This man who 
conquered and enslaved other human beings as the tyrant and the despot that he was. He's the originator of this city that is called Babel. And uh, it later became known as Babylon, Babylonia, the land, Chaldea, and of course that developed into the greatest empire that eventually destroyed Jerusalem and Israel and dispersed the Israelites out of the land. I am then reminded that Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia, that empire. But the Bible says that there's coming a day when Babylon, that city will be rebuilt and it will have a significant it will have a significant end-time role as we read the book of Revelation. So keep that in mind, keep that geography in mind, but also I want you to see something else. The word Babel and verse 9 and uh, also the building of the tower that was talked about in the first four verses of chapter 11. And then God coming down and, uh, and scattering them from their purposes. The word Babel in verse uh, 9 of chapter 11 is a word that literally means gate of God. It means gate of God. The building of this city was that it was to be a heavenly city, not a heavenly city as we would think of heaven, but a heavenly city as idolaters would think of it. And this tower was a step-like pyramid that at the top was a sanctuary for false gods. It was a place of idol worship. And so we're talking about idolatry in this geography. Someone said that man is incurably religious. And I would say there's a reason for that. The wisest man, Solomon, said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 that God has set the world in the heart of man. Literally, God has set eternity in the heart of man. In other words, human beings have an innate uh, uh, immortality sense in them. And that is what drives men to be religious. And the religion of men is as the book of Romans chapter 1 relates it. The religion of mankind is that they did not want to retain God in their thoughts. They wanted to throw off the restraints of God. And the Bible says that instead of worshiping God, they worship the creature rather than the creator. And that's what religion is. It's a human attempt, really, to fill that void that God has put in everyone, that, that, that sense of eternity in the heart of man. Religion is that attempt to fill that empty void with a man-made substitute. That's what idolatry is. That's what religion is. And I want to make it very clear, we don't practice religion here. Our relationship with the Lord is not something that we do. It's something that we are. That's very different. But I want you to see, as we look at uh, the history of the world here, not only the geography and uh, the idolatry, but think about the boundary that God has done here. In chapter 11 and verse 9, there is a play on words it's not evident in the English language, but there's a play on words uh, that links the word babble with the verb that is uh, translated confound in that ninth verse, which is balal, babel and balal. And it simply is this, that God would destroy the greatest strength of these people, their unity, which would result in their greatest fear. They would be scattered. They would be dispersed across the earth. What God did 
was confound the languages. In, in, in other words, instantly, they were conversing, and that conversation was turned to confusion. It was immediate. And that's how God accomplished it. One other thing that I want to mention before we, we leave this thought of the history of the world, and that is the imagery that is here in Babel. Babel, I believe, is the prototype of global one-worldism. Globalism, one-worldism. The predominant force and uh, the epitome of evil power, anti-kingdom, is really at the heart of Babel is at the heart of the history of world empires. It all harkens back to this. And Babel and this whole imagery, it will, as I said, have a significant role in the end times when the Antichrist will erect a global one-world government and it will be centered in the city of Babylon that in Revelation chapter 18, the Bible says God will destroy that city. Now we leave that rebellion, and I want you to see in verses 10 to 26, obviously we're not going verse by verse here, origin. From rebellion, I now see origin, because what you have in verses 10 to 26 is Shem's genealogy, and it is the genealogy of Shem in order to link Abraham to Shem. Really, if you think about it, what you have here in the genealogy of Shem in these verses is Israel's ancestry. That's what really we're talking about. And I want you to, to see that. In chapter 5, there is a genealogy and there's a total of the years that the, the man lived, and then it says, and he died, and that is repeated over and over again. However, in this genealogy, in chapter 11, the emphasis isn't on death, the emphasis is on life and blessing. And it traces Abraham, who, by the way, is a blessed man, it traces Abraham's lineage to Shem, who is blessed of God, or Shem's blessing is God, I should say, as we saw in chapter 9 and verse 26. But what happens here in these verses is very evident that God is moving to give nations an origin. But first of all, he gives a nation its origin. I believe that what's happening, what's happening here is that God is going to bless a particular nation. It's going to be the fulfillment, remember, of Genesis 3.15, that seed. And then in our memory verses, chapter 12, 1 to 3, God promises that he's going to give to Abram, he's going to make Abram a nation. He's going to make him a great nation, and through the great nation that comes from Abraham, he will bless all the nations of the earth. And when I thought about that, I was, I was reminded of the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's speech during World War II, and specifically during the Battle of Britain, when he referred to the Royal Air Force holding back and fighting against the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. And he said this, and I quote, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And I thought about that in relationship to what God has done and promised to do and is lining up to do here through Abram. That through Abram he'd bring forth a nation. Not a nation that was the largest nation on earth. Deuteronomy 7.7 7, God says to Israel, I haven't chosen you because you're the greatest number of all, but because you're the fewest of all. And I thought about that in relationship to Israel as a nation that never has so much been owed by so many to so few. A little nation 
that God has brought worldwide blessing to, and he's not done. There is still worldwide blessing that's going to come through Israel, according to the book of Romans chapter 11. And then finally, verses 27 to 32, there's a third movement of God here, and I call it migration. Because what happens in these verses, and perhaps I'll read them real quick so that we can uh, get see the movement in it. Now, these are the generations of Terach. Terach begat Abram, okay, so we know who he is. He's Abram's father. He begat Abram, Nahor, Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father in uh, Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives, gives the name of their wives. Sarah was barren, verse 30. Terah took Abram, his son, Lot, the son of Haran. Sarah, his uh, daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. They went forth from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. They came to Haran, and they dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. What is happening here? Listen very carefully. This is important. What is happening is that God moves in one family to move a family. God moves in a family to move a family. And what is God's purpose in this? From that family that God moves, he will build a nation, and again, through that nation, he will bless all the nations on this planet. But there's a problem here, at least in our eyes, not for God. And the problem is that Abraham's family were idolaters. According to Joshua chapter 24 and uh, verse 2, they worshipped idols. Joshua warns the people of Israel before his passing. He says to them, uh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelled on the other side of the flood, that's the Euphrates River, in old time, even Terach, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. They were idolaters. Well, that's a problem in our eyes, because Ur of the Chaldees, as well as Haran, worshipped the moon god. They were idolaters. And another problem is, Here is Abram, but we are told in uh, the, I think it's the the 30th verse, that his wife Sarah was barren. She was childless. And so God takes an idolatrous family, he moves an idolatrous family, and he chooses a man who has a wife that can't bear children, the least likely candidate to build a nation from, names him Abram, exalted father, and he's not a father, But God has a plan. You know, God took that one man in that idolatrous family. Perhaps I'm talking to someone today. God God has touched you in a family of idolaters, in a family of unbelievers. For some reason, God's put his hand upon you. And God is going to turn history in your family and perhaps in the family of other people because God has moved in your family to move you into a relationship with himself. And look at, in this, uh, in this uh, passage that I just read, there are eight people that are mentioned, but the focus is only on one person. That God reached down into an idolatrous family and he touched a family member. The God of glory appeared to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia, Stephen tells us in Acts 7 two. And he did so to bless not only that family, but to bless the entire world. And he also touched a dead, barren womb to begin a family and build a great nation. And and it's all by his power, and it's all for God's glory. There's great contrast in this chapter, if you think about it, between Babel and Abram. The world depends upon numbers for power. God takes two of the weakest people, and look at what he does. Babel, they were trying to make a name for themselves. God promises Abram, I'm going to 
make your name great. The world, they were trusting their human wisdom. Abram was trusting the word of God. They were trusting Babel, human power, trusting human pride. Abram, he was trusting the grace, the God of grace and the God of glory. I want you to think about this in closing. That Pentecost, which today in the liturgical calendar, today is Pentecost Sunday, incidentally. Today in the Jewish calendar, it's uh, Shavuot. Pentecost is actually the reversal of Babel. The tongues were confused at Babel, but the tongues were understood on Shavuot, on Pentecost. And the Bible foretells that there is a future blessing coming to this earth, according to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9, that God is going to see it once again, when he comes back and he establishes his kingdom, all the nations of the earth will be of one language. I guess the bottom line in this passage is this, that great nations do not get away with defying God. And by the way, neither do individuals. Where do you stand with God today? Nebuchadnezzar found out as emperor of the Babylonian Empire that he couldn't defy God and get away with it. Do you think you can? You know, yesterday, my wife and I got uh, some news that uh, one of our children who has a valuable dog was going to probably have to either be put down or they're going to have to get rid of this dog after several years because it's, uh, it's a herding dog that uh, has a guarding and protecting instinct bred into it and as a result isn't uh, really safe at times around people. And I was thinking, and even praying, uh, that that dog could be reclaimed somehow, maybe by being put on a farm with animals and do its job that way. But while I was thinking about that, God really spoke to my heart and said to me, you know, you're praying about the reclaiming of a dog, and that's okay. Well, what I'm interested in is the reclaiming of cities. I'm interested in the reclaiming of nations. And that's where I really want you to spend your time and be burdened about. I'm devastated by the burning cities in our country. I want to see these cities reclaimed, but I want to see them reclaimed for Christ. And that's the only way they ever will be reclaimed. I don't know how we can get Christ to these cities. God put me in this city uh, in two months. It'll be 24 years ago. I didn't want to come here, but he put me here. And God wants to reclaim this city. And I don't know how I fit into that. And I don't know how you fit into that. But I'm telling you, God has a burden to reclaim the cities. Urban reclamation. And I want us to pray for that. And I want us to be obedient to do whatever God wants us to do in order to reclaim the cities. Cities not only here, but cities around the world that need to be taken back and reclaimed for God, that Satan has usurped, that Satan has taken over, that Satan has sown evil and, and, and discord and hate and anger, just fomented it. We need to reclaim these cities for Christ. That's the message that I want to leave you with from the city of Babel. God, in mercy, scattered them so that they wouldn't reach the deepest level of evil that they would have had they stayed together.
God wants to reclaim our cities. And one day, God's people will be citizens of a city that no evil thing will ever enter. It's called the New Jerusalem. And I can't wait. I can't wait to be a part of that city. It's going to be so wonderful. It's beyond human imagination. It really is. That's what we have to look forward to. But until then, let's reclaim the cities in our nation and in our world. Let's pray that God would use us somehow. Give us wisdom. Give us guidance. Show us what we can do as individuals to reclaim the city. That God would break our hearts over this. It's not that we would be angry at what's going on, but that we would be broken over what's going on and cry out to God to use us somehow to reclaim our city. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you might work in us and through us. Give us your wisdom. Give us your hand of guidance. Lord, how I pray for this city. Lord, we live in a city that is just completely overrun with evil. Evil people in high places and evil people unrestrained doing what they want to do. Just like at Babel, seeking to get God out, overthrow God's rule. And here we are, and what a mess we're in because of that attitude. Lord, show us, how can we speak to this? What can we do about this? Show us specifically, Lord, and use us, we pray. May we be a people that are usable. May we be a people that are holy and a people that are not like the world around us, that we don't, that we don't epitomize the spirit of the world that we just talked about and that we don't repeat the same mistakes that was perpetrated at Babel. Thank you for the redemption and the reclamation of an Abram. Make us Abrams, Lord. Make us blessings in this city, we pray, and in the place where you have placed us in this nation, in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name.